at national, I was 18 months old. I then got up sober, which is brain pain, and I, uh, I messed up my whole insides and my mouth and my whole life. I was called, I, I got made to the hospital from the ambulance. My mum was called to say her goodbyes. Do you remember the accident? No, at all. No, I do not remember. Um, and so, what's your earliest memory of dealing with this? Also, my mother says, not they obviously got back at me so well. But I just remember seeing it at that time, like it was dark and just so. Like, I couldn't reload him at all at the time, and I just remember him coming. I, I, I never felt a feeling of anxiety like this. Like, just being that young and having to go through all that I do, it was. From the original event, what I remember was Sean Ross shouting to me that Keelan had taken something out of the press and I just thought there's nothing really in the press. So after a couple of seconds I came out of the bathroom and Keelan was falling around the floor, going mad on the floor. And whenever I picked him up, I could smell him burning, and his lips were starting to go black. So I freaked. Um, when we got into Stable, I remember just running through the doors, screaming for somebody to help me. And loads of doctors and nurses came running, but at the time in Stable, I think it was a Saturday morning, there was no surgeon in the hospital that could intubate Caitlin, bring him to theatre and intubate him, so they were waiting on a doctor to come, but Keelan wasn't going to survive. And just a few minutes later, two men came in the casualty door entrances and they were just coming to visit somebody. And as it happened, one of them was a doctor. He came in, wanted to know what was going on and said, OK, I'm going to intubate Keelan. I'm going to bring him to the theatre. I'm going to intubate him. And he did. And he said Keelan's out. It was just a regular morning. Um, Mum was out of the kitchen. I think I was standing on a chair or climbing up on something I had to get the toast and next thing Keelan just started screaming and I called for mum and I lifted him up and I kept rubbing on his mouth. Couldn't figure out what's going on. I was only seven, I guess. But um obviously then he, he started to spit or something because there was something on his hand because when I was holding him he touched me here and on my neck. And he burnt me and there's actually pigment out of my lip from what he transferred onto me so you can only imagine what happened inside of him yeah like it, it's it's weird like it's still there 20 years yeah. later and then obviously there was a lot of chaos that followed after that um yeah i remember we i was still in my nighty and we ran the doctor surgery was just beside us and whatever all happened there then uh, the ambulance was taking too long so um our uncle came to pick us up he just lived up the road and I can just remember him driving and then off the road the whole way to Saigo. He went so, 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 so fast. And we were in like this really dark, dingy room. I was sitting in a waiting area with my knees up like this, with my dressing, or my nightdress over me. I'm sitting and waiting and waiting and waiting and seeing people coming and going. And How did you feel? So scared. Confused. And I can remember mum being taken away from it. Like she wasn't like I don't know if I can picture her being dragged away or if I just know that she was dragged away but I just I, I can sense that she wasn't with him for quite a while. Before Keelan got brought to Dublin he was given his last rights and I was told the chances of him even making it to Dublin was very very slim very slim. 
so we got to Dublin, got to Temple Street. We didn't get to see Keelan for hours and hours and nobody really even came to see us or talk to us or tell us what was happening. It was hours, it felt like days and all day. But eventually a doctor came and said, you know, we did what we could, we put the track in, they put drains in. They, they told me that the, the acid, the caustic, that was, or the acid that was in the caustic was still burning inside them. Like, they basically told me he was like a sizzling sausage. So, and they told me that they did all they could at the moment. He was on a ventilating machine and everything. He was, they put him into a induced coma and they told me that just, it was just a waiting game now. He had like a caustic burn here. So they had to take him to surgery because they realised because the caustic was still burning, it was going to go into his jugular vein. So they had to bring him to theatre then to cut out this whole burn, to take the whole caustic out of the burn, so as that it couldn't keep burning him anymore. And I just remember thinking, Jesus Christ, how, how is this, you know, how is this even happening? I remember then they told me one night that we had to get our family all up, that Caelan wasn't going to make the night. And I was like, what are you talking about? Just put another machine on, you know, don't be telling me, you know, I just wouldn't accept that, that he wasn't going to survive. I remember we went down to the early garden centre and got him a little tape recorder with a cassette of Maniac 2000, because he actually loved that song before the accident, he used to dance with it. And all of a sudden his arm just went up like this and he started doing this when he hurt, so they knew then that he was starting to come round. He came round. But for weeks, like every day, Keelan was getting different treatments, different surgeries. Keelan was in Temple Street for, I think initially at the start, for maybe about three months in intensive care. And then he went to the HDU, back to intensive care, back to the ward, back to intensive care. That went on for weeks. But uh, yeah, Keelan made it, lived to tell the tale. You just asked the nurse, how do you think he's doing the day? He's got my first words. Will he survive it? Or the doctor, who, whoever I met first, you know. And uh, one of the things they did ensure us was he was a very big lad, big baby, but he was very strong. And they did tell us then that his will to live was unbelievable. So that, 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 that gave us a little bit of heart, but I used to count all the all the tubes and the wires that was into him, and there'd be 20, there'd be more at a particular time. He was always a very strong young man, always, even when he was in the hospital. You could see later that he was going to get himself through this because he was very strong, very determined young man he was. What do you think helped him get through it? What do you think was the reason why he survived? I think because he was young, strong, and I think he only his he only knew to fight. You know, like I think if it was an adult they would have just said, you know, give up. But I think just because he was such a young, strong boy that all he was going to do was fight, and that was it. And he fought, and he did fight. Like even the doctors and everything said, you know, we don't know. We've never seen somebody with the extensive burns to his mouth, his trachea, his esophagus. So they didn't even really know what to do next, you know, how to try and help him, how to try, you know, it was all kind of trial and error for them as well. Plastic surgeons trying to rebuild his mouth and everything like it was. It was just so tough, and they were great, amazing. The staff in Temple Street were absolutely amazing. One of the, the head, the head porter there, a man called John Doyle, became involved with him, and they've have a great relationship uh, ever since. Hi, my name is John Doyle. I'm head porter here at Children's Health Ireland, Tapestry. This is the very spot over 22 years ago when I first met Keelan and his parents as they were transferred from Letterkenny Hospital here to Tapestry. <laughs> Little did I know then that even till today, Keelan still amazes me on his journey through healthcare. He describes us as heroes, legends here in healthcare, but we're really not. Keelan's the real hero. His story deserves to be told.
People ask, what is health care? People say it's cure or care, and that's, that's basically what the package is. But we here in Tampa Street, including myself, and everybody who's been connected with Keelan and the family all over the years, look at it totally different. different. Uh, we have to walk in their footsteps to fully understand what's going through them on a daily basis. We all know significantly Keelan's injuries were catastrophic, but all through time, to all the processes, the 58 operations here in Tampa Street. Neither Keelan, Bernie, Grandad ever once complained about the service we delivered. Never complained about life in general. We were just unbelievable supporters of the work we were all doing together as a unit. It was going to make Keelan into who he is today. But the work that Keelan's team done behind the scenes, the nurses in Top Flat, every ward that Keelan has been in, they all adopted him as their own. They all wanted part of Keelan's story. We didn't know this at the time that it was going to become this, but we just did what we felt very much natural to do that. You're away from home. You're down in the capital of Ireland, Dublin. It's a very strange place in the first world. You probably don't understand half the lingos, right? But you kept smiling at us and you never once, now all I've known you, you never once told me to F off, take a hike, get out of the room. You just had this unbelievable belief in yourself that this is a process, this is life, this is what I'm going through and I'm going to come out of it at the end of the day. You've called me a hero for too long. The real heroes, everybody who knows me, are the patients in the bedside. It's my colleagues across healthcare who deliver unbelievable healthcare and a lot, lot more. But to me, as I progress nearly to retirement age, as people seem to think it, your inspiration is a motivation for me and many thousands of other people in the industry to keep getting up, keep coming back, keep believing in what we're doing it makes a difference. So I've seen you from an 18 month old all through your journey, even when you came to me and said, I'm going to the minor hospital and I'm transitioning and how's it going to go? And I told you, you're going to have a great team up there. You're going to have a team who are very much focused, like me, on delivering the very, very best. You had dark days about that experience as well. You're probably the only guy in your lifetime that got me to visit you in the hospital because I hate going to other hospitals. What I did it was I felt you were giving me something to give back to you. Your journey in life has been one of the most remarkable I've come across. And I sincerely do wish that it continues that way. Because you're a superstar. I told you for all the years here, the nurses have told you, the Lamorty's team have told you. Never doubt yourself. Your family, you've just been one of the most remarkable bunch of people I've had the privilege to come across. As I say, we made a lot of friends with a lot of people after doctors and nurses and things, you know, and the, the work that they do is not properly recognised at all, you know. And I suppose uh, my daughter Roshi worked very, very hard and was very tough and hard. She yeah. looked after him very, very well for a number of years after. Uh, as you would be aware, he, he, he wasn't even unable to have food. He used to get fed at night and there was these, these uh, bags of, of food that they were always hung up on a, on a, on a stand and, and it would be plugged into his stomach at night and he'd, he'd have the food at night. He, he couldn't have anything during the day, you know, and she learned a lot and she learned how to train this and she trained as well to clean this tacky and to take it out and put it in and she was 
she was she was more than a mother. She was a nurse as well, like you know. Mom, mom was the one that got up in the morning. She done Keelan's trackies. When Keelan's trackies fall out, when Keelan would choke on a friggin' sausage. <laughs> Oh, when we'd be walking in the shopping centre and some woman would be staring at Keelan or a child would be staring at Keelan, like she she dealt with all of that. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for a certain simple that not only helped me in the go through everything that I've gone through, but she's also gone through the bill and stuff. But she didn't help, you know. She every every operation, every appointment, every like she put her whole leg off to help me get where I am today. I don't think she ever know where I am. Just because, you know, I would always be in pain, I'd always be uncomfortable, and I'd always be like, oh, because I was young, I didn't understand at the time, not really. Yeah. Damn it, I'm always young. Doctors used to say to me, keep them away, you know, keep them away from other kids, keep them away from being outside too much. He was never really allowed to go to the beach because of the sand. He could never go swimming because of the water, because he has a tracheostomy. Playing football and stuff, he never would have liked to play football. He never really would have had friends his own age. Keelan always used to want to hang out with the older the older boys on the street and the older boys at school so I think just because he couldn't really do a lot of what the younger boys his age would have been doing. Keelan went to play school, didn't really like it very much but he went anyway. Um, he went to mainstream school which I think done him great justice because you know mainstream school is the way to go for smart boys. <laughs> I think it was daunting for him, I'm sure he was the only kid that didn't look the same and um, I guess shame on the parents who didn't have that conversation with their, their children that not everybody looks the same, you know, and it's not that Keelan had a, a disability but it's along the same lines and, um, and yeah, I, I remember particularly one boy that had moved from, I think it was Dublin or Belfast and he was really awful, feeling really, really awful. And I remember, I think I was in fifth or sixth class, and I was for hurting this little boy, for hurting my little brother, like, and he was only a baby at the end of the day. Um, but I don't know, like, I'm still glad that Keelan went to mainstream primary school and dealt with what he did deal with rather than going into a special needs school because he definitely wouldn't be the person he is today. He wouldn't have learned his social skills, communication skills and everything else that's in that brain of his. So definitely hats off to my mother for requesting that because if the medical professions had had their way, Keelan wouldn't be who he is today as well. Yeah, he, like he was very happy, you know, very happy child growing up. He would have got sick quite a few times. He had pneumonia a few times, the old, getting stuff stuck in his esophagus quite a few times. Mm. Had to have surgery a few times to have pieces of chicken or a nut one time removed from his esophagus. So as he got older then he realised you know what he could and couldn't really eat. He would never try anything new without somebody being with him. Mm. It was always just sloppy diet, yogurts, ice cream, chocolate, jelly, stuff that would melt and wouldn't get stuck. So I feel him, he was just Kind of very into himself, looked after himself, um, didn't really mingle or mix too much with anybody growing up until his later years when he was about 16 or 17 when he started going um, out. And what did you notice um, caused this change in him? I think I'm getting my back hand cut an awful lot, the great bird she is. I think that definitely gave him the confidence boost. Um, he started working in a local bar as well, which I think, you know, he was meeting people and I think that gave him some confidence as well. Uh, Keelan was always very paranoid about his speech, always very paranoid about how he looked. Like he would never really let anybody take photographs or anything off him, he didn't like that. But yeah, just as he got older, his confidence grew with the help of some very good people that he has in his life.
good friends, um, his girlfriend Rebecca definitely gave him a great confidence boost. Definitely helped him through it. When we were, when we, when Keelan was younger, we used to go on our walks and talk about everything and anything. We talk about football. We talk about movies. We talk a lot about just life and interactions and different things like that. But when Keelan was probably 16, I remember him being a bit more self-conscious, a bit more self, kind of, um, not self-aware, but more maybe um, concerned about how the future played out for him when, you know, I, I remember a specific incident where we spoke about um, kissing girls. And the first thing he said to me was, how am I going to kiss girls with no lips? And it broke my heart that he was having those kind of issues in his head, because that's where it all was. It was all in his head. I mean, it was a self-confidence thing. It was a self-image thing. It was a crisis within himself. I don't, to my knowledge again, I don't know if anybody would have said anything towards him that would have made him think those things, but it was definitely there. It was definitely a part of it, but I mean, within, six months of that conversation he was going out with Rebecca and he was never as happy. It was from my idea though and I wish they all knew how much they helped me but in the past eight years I've been going out with Rebecca yes. Well we've actually been in school since since we were four so we've known each other since then I was always saying it. Who's the age of I had my one or two friends in my school, and I was out with the football. I think it was six guys. Me and Dax were sat beside each other, and she was but a super smart, arty girl, and I was. Football. That's all I had. And she is absolutely the only person in football. I just remember. Well, I can't actually remember what year it was, but he won Donegal Person of the Year when we were like really, really young in school. And um, for some reason, I was really, really excited about this. But like, he wasn't. We weren't even really friends or anything at the time. But um, yeah, I remember they like told us at school that like, Keelan had won this. Uh, person of the year award. Um, I went home and I told my parents. I was like, oh my god, guys, Keenan won an award. And they were like, you know, like I just got really excited over it. It was like the first time that um, I got like really, I think I was just really inspired. Um, and I was really young as well. So it was the first time I kind of felt um, that um, he was special. So. <laughs> Uh, he's definitely the most passionate person I've ever met in my life. He got into drumming. He literally has has like drummed every day since he started. He is obsessed with getting out. I used to play a lot of theatre growing up, so there was always a lot of good music on that. So I was playing my bass melodies of music. I have a light section for, you know, more. I guess kind of something like that. Music was not big for me. Um, I started working with Jason Ball and a good eye for him to work with. That's where I started to sort of properly take my interest in it. And like seeing it in the front of you and seeing like what the basis is doing and what the genre is being able to how four or five people have to work together to make something. On the baseball, which it is, it's it, it, it plays perfectly all the time, you know. I was out in the ball then, then I go home and I started listening to music, watching music videos and watching live concerts, and there will always be good fighters at the time, but even like that. Even like, before I got the lot of music, I like food fighters, food fighters, and they go up us, a hero of me. Because I was here, being my mum. I thought the world, I remember watching it on NGV Docs one day, and I used to just. I was just going away at the time. So, between seeing that music video 
اما اون رو بالاش کار اما یه وقت بیش از پایان بودن کن قصه کار اون رو بالاش نیست کار کن به یه اسب کن دو بسون پیرو ام پنجاهشون ام پنج درجه کم بود که I've actually never heard so many random footballers' names being screamed at me for no reason at all. Like, and I don't even know these people. He just screams random facts about people I don't know all the time. And I probably really like whatever. But no, it's, it's it's actually really cool when you think about it. You know, he knows so much more than I could ever know. So you mentioned that when you were a kid, one of the few things you could talk about was football. Yeah. Um, tell me how that helped you growing up. Watching football, uh, I helped get my mind off. My life, <laughs> just because it's always, it's the same at everyone. Like, they have football on my head and they might have a hobby that helps wash it away or make it a bit easier. And football was mine. I was kind of gone, like, I used to watch every single night I've been and every other day that used to be on. I used to go to the pub and watch. I used to watch my night on the 19s and <laughs> I used to live with about everyone and I used to play it as well. You know, we used to play the like shine football and I just, I used to treat it like it was the World Cup, you know, you know them kind of people. <laughs> but yeah, I was never able to play for a team, you know, because at the time I used to be upset because I had a doctor's note from three separate doctors and the people in charge said no, nah, insurance wasn't covered, they can't afford it and I used to go off my head crying and I used to have the worst pain forever so I used to go on a bit from that and, and uh, but as I grew up I realised I was like yeah, growing up like, You can but, understand their yeah. side of things because I, I've been playing football every young time, right? and then I used to play at home, out in the garden, you know, with neighbours and stuff, and nothing ever happened. So I thought, oh, why would anything happen now? But all it was a shock, I was going on football for the pro and night night. So, by the time it was hard to hear. Bex took his mind off footballers, football jerseys, my United, and um, opened his eyes to music and art, which I think was really great. But I wouldn't take the football away either because I think it was his love of football that um, used to get him to come down to the pub that I was working in to come down and like to watch games, and I'd throw him up a couple of seven ups and. It got to the stage then when I didn't have to buy him seven ups because if it wasn't this punter, it was the other punter. And then it was getting to the stage where they were asking me, "Where's, where's Keelan? Why isn't he dying? There's football on." So he became kind of a staple in, in the pub after a while. Yeah. Oh, after I think maybe like two weeks because he used to scream at the TV, and that that taught people that Keelan had a voice that. Even though he looked different, especially around his mind, I think that made people nervous to speak to him. And then the fact that he was given out to whoever he was given out on the TV, that, that I think that like took the edge off for people yeah. to talk to him. Um, 
but yeah, I'm sure before we knew it, he was working in the bar. Were there ever any incidents or issues in the town? I would never say it was an incident in the town. It was possibly one time in uh, the chase and bull when he got hit. But to be fair, he took it like a champ. <laughs> it was very, very busy. It was unbelievably busy. It was that busy where, like, you know, the the people in the bar would just become one, and like the mass would just like go from left to right, and you couldn't really do anything. And Keelan had to just, you know sneak through all these people trying to collect all these glasses and I didn't see it happen or whatever but I just heard it afterwards that someone someone pulled out his his thing in his in his throat this uh, the thing that he breathed through so that, that was a big commotion you know what I mean that everybody was really angry because Keelan is from this town everybody all the locals they were I don't know who this guy was or who did it but I don't think he was from here because otherwise he would have known Keelan I guess so uh, uh, so there was a lot of anger, everybody was just, <laughs> everybody just wanted to beat this guy up basically, <laughs> you know, like, and everyone, like, not, not only the guys that were working there, but the girls too, everybody, everybody was just like, where is this dude, I'm gonna get him, <laughs> you know, you see him just going through this crowd of, of people that are just, that are wasted, and he's there with like a tower of glasses, you know, it's a shitty job for anyone. <laughs> and then he's also he's going around and, you know, it might be hard to talk as well and with the loud music, it's hard to understand each other and things like that, you know, and he's trying to get through this crowd and it's just shit. And I felt bad for him already just doing that job. Yeah, yeah. And then having to deal with someone like that who thinks it's funny or whatever. I don't know why he did it, but it's just, you know, it's, a, it's terrible. Yeah. It's, it's terrible. <laughs> ridiculous. I suppose there's always that guy out there. Yeah, you know? I guess so. Um, but yeah. thankfully, like you said, there was huge support from the town. Huge support. And why, 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 why is it, do you think, that that exists? You know, why is it that the town feels so supportive of Keelan? Um, I believe, I think the first reason is I have noticed that just this town is just a really tight community, you know? So if it's Keelan or if it's someone else from this town, it's, it's always, a reaction like that is always going to happen because if someone is being abused or being attacked by someone who's not from around here, then everybody would would have their backs. And in Keelan's uh, case especially, because Keelan was only young at that time as well, he was only a kid. And you know, everybody knew Keelan, everyone knows Keelan because Keelan is the kid, super friendly kid. and. You know, it's, it might be bad to say, but you're always like, oh, you know Keelan, you know Keelan, you know Keelan with the... <laughs> and then everybody knows straight away, you know, oh yeah, Keelan, of course. You know, I think that's why that, that, that there might be a little bit of extra uh, support and backing for, for Keelan, because everybody, especially all the locals, know what he's been through. Mm -hmm. And all those operations that he had to go through and all that, all that shit that he had to go through. So, you know, it, it, I, I, like I said before, if it happens to anyone from this town, there'll be support. But I guess you know, this case, it would be, you know, there'd be that bit, that bit extra. Be fired up. Then. <laughs> fired up <laughs> All these things that, that would have would have made other people seek sympathy or or the poor me card or anything like that. Whereas Keelan never looked for anything like that. Keelan just went from strength to strength to strength, and the man he is today is testament to his own will and his own ability to pursue what he wanted and overcome all those obstacles that were put in front of him unfortunately but he did very very well to overcome all of them. Then he moved to working in the, super, the, super, the supermarket uh, stacking shelves or whatever you know he then he was a bit older but he was still a kid I think to me anyway you know and he looked miserable in there. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so again, I, I, and that's when I got to know him better. I think you know, I saw him like I went in there loads. I got chatting to him a lot, and you know, and then I really got to know him. Uh, he's a, you know, he's a good kid. Like he's really nice, always super friendly. Sometimes you know, a little bit hard to understand, but you know, it's all right. You know, I always laugh, and uh, I can always ask what what I have to ask sometimes three times, but that's all right. <laughs> but um, anyway, and then. Had the restaurant, couple of years, uh, 
you know the the burrito place there's a lot of people coming and going so uh, so every every year I had to basically almost get a new team and uh, I knew Keelan uh, st stopped working at the, at the supermarket and I knew he, he maybe hadn't worked in a while or whatever and maybe looking around doing something and then uh, you know I was like you can work come work work with me you know work, work uh, rolling burritos and now he didn't have any experience making food or any kind of food related experience I don't think um, but um, but it's not that hard anybody can, anybody can learn how to do it you know and I know it's all about personality if you have a good personality and you're friendly you know the, the job itself is easy it's it's more the, the hardest part about the job is standing there every day, smiling, and being friendly to everyone who comes in, you know? And I knew Keelan, super friendly guy. Now he was a little bit older now, maybe in his 20s or something. So, you know, he was like, he was not a kid anymore. All of a sudden he was like football, and he was kind of a little bit, a little bit solid, like this, you know? And, uh, and uh, Keelan, I said, come and work in the, in the burrito place. I'm just so grateful because I know as a young person who suffers with mental health and has to deal with his features changing after every surgery and getting used to how he looks now and getting used to everyone around him looking at him a wee bit different for a while and until that wears off like I am just so grateful that he has his community of, of people and that like I just I think they'll always be there for him, truth I can bring. You know, the two of you are living together now in the new house. Is this something that you ever imagined? Oh, yeah, like I've been thinking about this pretty much from the very start. I think when we really started going out, um, what age were we when we were going out? Like 15, 16? 16, yeah, so since then I've been imagining it and I'm just hoping it will come around. Now it's here and I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really cool. It's nice. It feels like we've come a long way, you know. And uh, you know, as of course, he uh, he has matured since that. He has a, a car now, and he was uh, passed his test. I think on the first time, as far as I know, and he's a nice girlfriend, and he's living a normal life. And he's doggy. And he's a dog, and <laughs> uh, he works, uh, as you know well, he works down in Supervisor. He did work over in Simpsons prior to that. So he does all the normal things that, that, that every day, the normal things that the normal people do every day. I'm proud of myself because I've come this far and I'm able to not shy away from it. I'm able to own it. It's funny looking back because when I, when I used to play pictures, I used to hide my mouth, I used to cover my mouth with my t-shirt. Like that, <laughs> I cover it. Like that. I don't like. I. I don't think we're there yet. <laughs> Do you still feel self-conscious? I have my days. <laughs> yeah. And when when you do have your days, how do you get yourself out of them? I just go and see my family. I sit down in the back with me or TV or something like the main thing is knowing that it's there, you know? But then you can't dwell on it. Like, so for me, I might put on headphones and listen to music, I might watch a movie, I might go see my little sister, she's only two, not even, and just being with her, just, you know, you just kind of forget everything because you're just so enamored with it's a life who you go with you, even though it's from Barry Street, you know, as me and Bex might go for a walk with Maddie. They might talk about absolute nonsense, or they might talk about life, you know, either one works perfectly. We always know that whatever's going on will come out eventually, but you just have to acknowledge it, and you, you just have to believe in yourself that you will come over. You will get out the other side, perfect. 
like it's funny how your mind works you know one day you can do something the next day you're like what was I thinking and that happens when you occupy yourself but the main thing is going off <laughs> going off and push it away and pretend it's not there so yeah just have your right there and just, just, just take the issue. Yeah, just don't push it away. <laughs> don't put it under the sink. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Because <laughs> I won't let it, I just want to say thank you so much. It's just unbelievable. And it's just hard to put in the world. It's very painful and excited I am about this. I hope I'm not. Uh, Looking for attention <laughs> by you, and the message I want to share is that life can be shit for everyone, anyone, no matter what they look like from the outside. But I just want them to know that anything is possible. You can get through a lot of stuff. You just need to surround yourself with nice people, and yeah. The community. I want to thank Ryan more than anything because <laughs> from the minute I said it to him, to you, you've had it all day out and you were so willing to do it. Thank you very much. <laughs> no problem. Oh, I'm getting emotional now, like, God damn it. Uh, thank you to everyone. Everyone who came on here and sat in front of the camera. Thank you to everyone who's shown interest. Thank you to everyone who's gonna watch this, hopefully. <laughs> but uh, yeah, under the kitchen sink. Uh, yeah. Don't think I'll six order. <laughs> <laughs>